Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you all for the uh, fantastic opportunity to talk here today. It's a really a pleasure for me to be able to communicate with our future uh, young scientists. So thank you very much for having me, and I hope that I can keep you entertained for the next hour or so. Um, I'm going to be breaking down uh, today's talk into four pieces. Uh, the first one is going to be, like Paul said, to give you kind of an introduction of how my career took me to where I am today. And hopefully that will help some of you uh, figure out your career paths or at least ask the right questions. And then I'm gonna be talking about uh, two projects um, as was announced, uh, one in biomedicine, one in environmental science. And then the last piece will be uh, for you guys to ask questions. I'm gonna try and leave as much time as possible to get some good interactive Q&A going at the end. All right, so let's start with the beginning. Um, I was a high school student one day, a long time ago, just like you guys, and I wasn't quite clear what I wanted to do. I had a lot of options in terms of ideas and things that interested me, but nothing really sort of grabbed me. I wasn't really super passionate about anything. I was very good at chemistry in school, and it came relatively easily to me. So I thought, well, you know, take the easy path and, and do what you're good at, and you don't have to work too hard at it. So I studied chemistry and uh, I went to a school in London. This is uh, downtown London. This is the tower in the middle of my school. It's called Imperial College. And it's uh, right in the middle of London, right by the Science Museum and, and the other museums. And it's a, it's a wonderful school. It's very much like MIT. It's a, it's a science only school. And, um, and I, I enlisted in the chemistry program and sat through lectures, sat through lab, and it wasn't at all what I was hoping for. It was actually kind of boring. Uh, it was very traditional. So they didn't really talk about any of the modern problems that we faced in our society and how chemistry is solving these problems. It was really a lecture that could have been given maybe 20 years earlier. Uh, we did a lot of labs and they were okay, but it wasn't particularly thrilling. So at the end of my uh, undergrad career, I had uh, decided I was going to enlist in a totally different thing. I was gonna do a marine biology master's program uh, in the South of France and just get away as far as I could from London and from Imperial College and chemistry. Having said that, uh, the last six months of the undergraduate program requires the students to do a research project. And uh, basically you choose your mentor, you choose your project and you spend the last six months doing nothing but research, pretty intense uh, schedule. And that's when everything changed for me. I, I absolutely fell in love with research. I thought it was the greatest thing. And it completely revolutionized my way of thinking about science and what I wanted to do. So I stayed at Imperial College and did a PhD there in chemistry, organic chemistry, which led to me coming to the United States because I wanted to apply that. You remember I said that uh, I was kind of frustrated that we didn't do anything relevant to our current problems. Uh, my main concern at the time was the environment and, and climate change and sustainability. So I uh, decided I would come to America to uh, work at a few companies that uh, were dealing with environmental problems. We didn't really do much of that in Europe at the time and learn what I could and then come back to Europe and start my own company because I always had the entrepreneurial bug in me. Well, it turns out that I came to Pasadena in uh, 1993 and I fell in love with Pasadena and Southern California and decided, you know what, I'm gonna hang around here a little longer. I worked for a small uh, company working on developing and researching air, air pollution using uh, technology that they had developed. And I worked for them for about four or five years and again, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I really learned that I missed being in the lab, doing research, doing research on things that necessarily did not have a product uh, just for the sake of asking interesting questions. And I also missed uh, mentoring students. For me, the big driver when it comes to research uh, was this really kind of nearly um, religious experience. And I'm not a religious person, but for me, um, doing research nearly was being religious in a sense. And it's, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but it's, it is a unique way of interacting with nature. You ask a question by doing an experiment and you get an answer. And you always get the same answer if you ask your questions right. And those answers allow you to put together a puzzle and understand the, the sort of underpinnings of how nature works. And for me, that was so enlightening and motivating 
that I wanted to get back into it. However, I'm not a big company kind of guy, so I didn't really want to go back to university. I didn't want to go into industry. And so I started what I thought would be a very easy uh, path, a career path. In 1998, I started the Oakrest Institute. And I thought, how hard can it be, right? You start a small nonprofit. Uh, I had been quite successful uh, getting grant money, getting grant funding for research projects in my previous job. And so I thought, being at a nonprofit, people are going to bend over backwards to give me money. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, it'll be easy. And before I know it, I would, we would have a big campus, we'd have lots of students, and it'd be really superb. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. It, uh, it actually was a lot harder than that. Uh, but I went into it with, uh, with uh, a lot of energy and, uh, and a lot of dreams. And so basically, what does Ochris do? Our goal from the very beginning was to do high impact chemistry and biology research. High impact meaning things that people like all of us here care about. Uh, the environment, medicine, human health, not developing obscure uh, systems to measure obscure numbers that nobody really cares about, or uh, developing uh, military uh, devices. But the other part of what we wanted to do, because that's not necessarily unique, uh, we wanted to really reach out to students who don't have the opportunity to, to do research. Uh, a lot of high school students uh, don't get a chance to do to be in the lab and really do research, nor do community college kids. And education and research to me are very linked because with research, you get a hands-on experience that you cannot get any other way. And it was so transformative for me that I kind of wanted to pass this along and make this available to other people. And this is a mission that evolved over the first three years or so, but it is really how we started out. So uh, I'm going to take you through a quick journey of, of Oakcrest. Uh, we started off, as I said, in 1998. So we've been around over 20 years already. Uh, most of our funding is exactly the way it would be if you were at Caltech or UCLA. We have to compete for uh, grant funding from the government and foundations against the very best people in the country. So we are doing high impact research. Otherwise, we couldn't survive. We're organized like, much like a university, but we're much smaller we have a really open type of layout where uh, we can interact with one another, which, which makes us kind of unique because we all talk to each other. We all try to be uh, working on each other's projects and helping each other out. We're also available in the pre-COVID days. We were available year round to people coming in and uh, being part of the, of, the, of the family. We make it really easy to people, for people to apply and be, and be part of us. So basically, uh, I'm going to hit a few milestones uh, because I think that kind of exemplifies how you get something like this off the ground. This young lady here is our, is our first student uh, that was at our 10-year anniversary party. Uh, some of our initial funding, right, you got to get money from somewhere to do all this stuff, came from the Air Quality Management District because we were doing environmental work. The, the Health Effects Institute also uh, funded a lot of our early work, as well as the NIH which has been very generous to us throughout. Amgen donated a lot of equipment to us in the early days. And that was mediated very much through Wendy Johnson here, who uh, used to be a professor at Pasadena City College. And she was an instrumental uh, collaborator and friend uh, right from the beginning because she hooked us up with community college kids whom I didn't know much about when I first started, but uh, they seemed to be an incredible reservoir of talented uh, students. And uh, we brought in our first student back in the early days, around 2001, as a, at the recommendation of Wendy. And uh, that is him right here, Steve Pastel. And he performed extremely well in the lab. In fact, these others, these other four, were all Caltech undergraduates at the time. And uh, they all interacted very well, and they all worked very well together. It was really quite a, a remarkable thing to see how well, the, how well they, per they performed. And that really transformed our, our mission and our way of of kind of recruiting students. We really saw the community college pool as very much an untapped potential uh, of talent. And, uh, and so we, we, we expanded our efforts in that, in that uh, arena. This uh, gentleman down here is uh, Professor Mike Hoffman at Caltech. He's an environmental scientist and one of my earliest collaborators in the very early days of Oakcrest. And, and thanks to him and, and my association with him, we were able uh, to get some funding early on when we didn't have a lot of credibility. This young lady here is uh, Wendy Kano. 
She is our bookkeeper and uh, has been a, an instrumental part of the Ocris family since the very early days, as has this young man over here, uh, Dr. John Moss, whom I was able to lure into joining me, uh, thanks to Mike, because uh, John was doing a postdoc at Caltech at the time, and I was able to recruit him and, and have him join Ocrest. And that was really when things changed at Ocrest, because John and I together were able to kind of build this, this mission. So fast forward a little bit, and we had uh, a couple more people join us uh, to, to be part of the family. Uh, Mangela Gunawardena uh, came and joined us and helped bring biology to Ocrest, because we were all chemists at the time. And, and that was transformative in many ways. And Paul Webster, whom you guys already all know, uh, also joined uh, shortly after Manji and uh, brought uh, more biology expertise as well as uh, world-class uh, electron microscopy imaging expertise, which was really complemented what we were already doing. Kirsten joined us as well around that time and she's our grants management officer. So you can see we were already growing and becoming uh, large enough that we needed to hire someone to administer all our grants. And one of those grants from the Rose Hills Foundation uh, funded eight community college kids or students to do research in the lab for six months. And uh, here you can see uh, our pool from, from one of the years and they were, were phenomenal and, uh, and f ended up giving a, a wonderful seminar at the Huntington Gardens uh, facility. Another thing that you need when you do science research is you need really good toys, really expensive, nice toys to uh, be able to measure all the things you need to measure. One of those is an NMR instrument, which is a nuclear magnetic resonance instrument. It's a, a liquid helium cooled magnet into which you drop samples and uh, you can kind of get a fingerprint of uh, their, the environment of the molecules that are, that are in your sample. And it's an extremely important instrument if you're doing chemistry. And I must admit that when I started Ocrest, I never really thought I couldn't imagine us owning one of those and, and now we have one in, in a dedicated room. So that's kind of just an example of how things can happen uh, if, you, if you persevere and just stay nose to the grindstone. This little guy here, you'll be hearing a lot more about in a minute, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on it, but that was an important part of our scientific growth was our, our intravaginal ring project for HIV prevention. All right, so moving forward in 2014, we were lucky enough to be able to purchase a building in Monrovia. It's a small campus that's made up of four buildings, two large ones and two little ones. We have since uh, added this one on this side and then two more on that side, so we're growing. And that's an important part of, of uh, developing a, an organization is to grow, but not to grow too quickly so that you're able to stay sustainable. We've since also taught about 400 students uh, about obtaining lab experiences. These are all students who were in the lab for at least three months uh, doing research hands-on. And we have them all commemorated in posters uh, along one of our hallways. Two more people joined us uh, in the, the more recent uh, past. Uh, Chris Booser, Dr. Chris Booser, who is another microscopist and biologist to really build on, on that infrastructure of biology that we've uh, established. And then Peter Anton, who uh, is still affiliated with UCLA. He's a world-class HIV researcher and a medical doctor. So now we have the capacity in-house to do clinical studies because we have a medical director. Again, an important part, building block in our growth. So the types of programs that we offer um, are all based on cutting edge science research. We don't cut any corners because you guys are way too smart and you would figure out right away that what you're doing is just a cooking recipe. It's not really science. So you gotta give good science experiences and those are funded through our grants, which as I said before, are, are competing against the best minds in the country. So we have to be doing something right. We don't give degrees, but we do give experiences. And I think that's very important in science because I think a lot of people stray away from uh, a, a career in science because the, the disillusioned like I was. I was lucky enough to get a research experience late in my undergraduate career. But if you can do that early on in high school or community college, I think it could be very helpful in helping you choose a, a different career path than you otherwise might have done. And the rest of the other uh, pieces you already know, uh, except for the fact that we really do enjoy a wonderful relationship with the city of Monrovia since we moved here. They've been phenomenal partners uh, for us and, uh, and we're collaborating on trying to build the local ecosystem for science here in Monrovia. 
All right, so that really concludes the, the first piece of my talk. And I wanna transition into uh, the first major research effort that's been going on here for quite a long time now. And that is really trying to make a dent or difference in the global HIV pandemic. And uh, this slide is a little bit busy, but it kind of illustrates for you that even though here in the US, we may think that HIV is kind of un under control, which it's not, but we think it is. Um, there are other parts in the world where it's, where it's in a lot more precarious situation. Sub-Saharan Africa, meaning below the Sahara, su the Southern portion of Africa is, is still a hotspot where uh, we are basically getting way too many new infections every year. And young women and girls are particularly at risk from contracting HIV. They, they dominate the new infections. So every week, 7,000 new infections occur among young women globally, which is 42 infections every hour. So in the time that I have left talk to you today, we will probably have had over 40 new infections of HIV, and this is ongoing. So we really do need to come up with new ways of helping young women prevent contracting HIV, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So how do we do this? Well, the first part is we have to understand a little bit more uh, the biology of the vaginal mucosa because it is through um, uh, sexual interactions that these young women uh, tend to contract HIV. This is a sexually transmitted infection. And we wrote a book chapter on the vaginal mucosa, which is basically the vaginal tissues that underlie um, the, uh, the structure and, and where the immune cells circulate in the vaginal space, where we think uh, is the focal point of HIV infection. So if you imagine that this is the, 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 the top, the, the part that's exposed in the vagina, and uh, you have lots of bacteria there, and um, they form a biofilm, a mucosal biofilm. Underneath of the surface of these uh, layer of bacteria, we have the vaginal epithelium, and in there you have a, a variety of different immune cells. You've got uh, dendritic cells, uh, you've got Langerhans cells, and you've got the famous macrophages that you might have heard about, as well as the T cells. Now, here you can see a cartoon of uh, different uh, HIV particles and how they interact with these cells through certain receptors on the cells. Eventually, uh, most of these cells are able to transport HIV, but most of them cannot support the uh, reproduction of HIV. Only the T cells, uh, we think, are, are capable of, of maintaining a, a, a growth of the virus. So you have these cells, the dendritic cells, for example, or these macrophages that can be um, essentially Trojan horses. They can carry the virus and, and then send it to the T cells, which are a little deeper in the mucosa. So our, our thought was, well, if we can deliver drugs that uh, are used to treat HIV, so once you already are infected, the same drugs that prevent replication of HIV in infected individuals, if we can administer those drugs vaginally um, and have them there in these compartments before someone gets infected, then maybe these uh, drugs will prevent HIV replication and essentially sterilize the infection so that you know, the virus just goes away and prevents infection. So how do you give a drug vaginally? Well, one approach is to use an intravaginal ring and the intravaginal ring um, here's an example of one right here. It, it sits, this is a, a MRI scan, but basically the, the, the ring would sit just uh, above or below the cervix, so deep inside the vagina. And uh, it's a technology that's been around since the 1970s, where the first patent on intravaginal rings uh, was written, but it has evolved considerably since then, mostly for contraception. But in 2005, uh, Malcolm, developed a vaginal ring for HIV prevention using a very bad drug called the pivorine. It was the best drug at the time, I guess, for, for, for that application. But uh, they did really well with that. They, they developed some innovative technology and they showed that uh, the, the pivorine ring may have some promise for HIV prevention. And you know what? Um, in answer to my question here at the bottom, does it work? Actually, yes, it does. Um, the vaginal ring developed by Malcolm has since undergone extensive clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa. And it has shown that, that if people use it, it, it will work reasonably well 
at protecting from HIV. So the theory works. So what did we do? Well, our technology is a little different. It's, it's kind of unique. Uh, we came up with what we call the pod IVR design, the pod intravaginal ring design, where you have drug tablets, these white squares, this is a side view, and these drug tablets can be 100% drug or drug mixed with other things, like the pills that you would take orally, like an aspirin. And then like an aspirin, these drugs would be coated with a, shown in red here, a polymer. And a polymer controls how quickly the, the drug releases out of these tablets. And we call that the pod. And these pods are located inside a rubber, if you want, an elastomer, a plastic device. And the device, all it does is really hold these tablets and it provides a mechanical channel for the drugs to diffuse out into the vaginal space. So here's a photograph of one of our rings. It has four pods that you can see here. And with this uh, zoomed view, you can see the little hole here through which the drug releases out from the pod. The drugs cannot release through the elastomer, they release primarily through these channels. So now you can imagine if I change the number of, cha of channels, here it is three, here's only one, I can also change the diameter of the channels and I can change the coding that's on this tablet. All of these things will help me uh, modulate how quickly the drug releases. So I have a lot of degrees of freedom to control the release of the drug from the ring. So what does this look like? Well, here's a light microscope image of a pod uh, where we've put some dye in the polymer coating, which is very thin in this particular case. And uh, we used a biodegradable polymer to coat a core that consists of IgG. So it's essentially an antibody. I'm sure you've heard a lot about those uh, with uh, COVID-19. We can also image uh, the polymer coating with fluorescence, uh, fluorescent dye and then look at it by fluorescence microscopy. And from that, we can also calculate the, the thickness of the coating, which in this case was 100 microns, so nearly smaller than the size of a hair. All right, so we've developed this cool new technology from scratch, from concept. We've uh, done a lot of studies in the lab to show that uh, these rings release and they release linearly. And we can, we can indeed control the release, as I said, with uh, changing the characteristics of, uh, of, the, of the formulation and uh, the pores, the, core, the, the, the delivery channels, sorry. Now, how do these things really work in animals? Because you have to unfortunately test them in animals before you can go into people. We did a number of studies in sheep, in macaques, which are a, a, a non-human primate uh, form, and also in rabbits and shown that they, we can indeed transfer this lab release to in vivo release. So then we had the big experiment. The big experiment was in macaques where we wanted to see, do these rings actually protect the macaques from contracting a hybrid form of HIV called SHIV? So basically, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details here, but essentially this is a really, really rigorous model of how to test the efficacy of preventing HIV in macaques. And it's developed by the CDC and it was done in collaboration uh, with the CDC. Basically what happens is you uh, have these uh, female uh, pigtail macaques. They all have a vaginal ring in place except for the controls, which are basically placebos. They don't have a ring in this case, the naive. And we exchange the ring every 14 days to make sure it has enough drug left. And for 16 weeks, once a week, we expose the monkeys vaginally to SHIV, which is this hybrid HIV simian immune deficiency virus. And then we just monitor to them to see if they contract SHIV or not. Uh, these particular rings had two drugs in them. These are the drugs that some of you may recognize that are in Truvada. This is uh, an FDA approved regimen orally for preventing HIV. It's also used as the, the uh, foundation for treatment with other drugs. So it was a good combination for us to, to use here. So we have these uh, tenofovitis aproxyl fumarate and intracytabine rings in the macaques. So how did it work? Well, I'm happy to tell you that all the macaques who wore the rings didn't get infected, whereas all the controls gradually got infected. So that at, at 10 weeks or 11 weeks, 
all the controls were infected, none of our monkeys got infected. So this was 100% protection from contracting the virus vaginally. This was a wonderful, wonderful result, and we were very excited about this. All right, so having established that we can develop this technology, uh, we can manufacture it at a small scale for uh, these animal studies, we, we now progress to a clinical trial. So we got permission from the FDA and we did a clinical trial, but it was a kind of a complicated design. We wanted to see what would happen when we added a, a drug incrementally to the rings and see how, how that behaved in terms of its uh, release and the distribution of the drugs in tissues and how safe they were. This is not an HIV prevention trial. It is a very early stage trial just to see are those rings safe and do we get the drug to where it needs to go theoretically for HIV prevention. So this is a seven day trial. The FDA wouldn't let us do a longer one at that point. So the first drug only contained, sorry, the first ring only contained one drug, which is this TDF. Ring goes in, after seven days, the ring comes out. We wait for a little bit and then the same six women uh, get the same ring, but now we added pods of FTC as well. Those are the two drugs that we used in, in that famous macaque study that you might have recognized. And when that's done, there is a break and we lose some of, of the participants because it was a, like a three month window. So we had six women, two from the previous study and four new ones. And now they get a, drug, a triple combination ring, the same two drugs from before, plus Maravroc, which is a drug that uh, prevents HIV entry into the cell. So it's complementary in terms of its mechanism to the other two, which prevent replication of the virus once it gets in. All right, so that's the design of the study. And here very quickly are some data where essentially what we're looking for now are the drug concentrations in the vaginal tissue. So these are tissue biopsies that are collected on day seven, just before the rings come out. When we have just the one drug, you can see that there is tenofovir, the parent. So this is a drug that has other pieces attached to it that come off when the drug is metabolized. Okay, this is the drug right here. And the drug then gets phosphorylated when it gets into cells and this is the piece that is active against HIV. So we're measuring both. So we can see both of these important compounds on day seven in the vaginal tissues of these women. When we add the new drug FTC, we still see those two compounds. So nothing has changed here, which is good. The drugs are not affecting each other. And we have a lot of this other new drug, the FTC. And then the same story when we add Maravroc, which is an orange, also good high tissue concentrations of Maravroc and the other three all stay more or less the same. So that shows that we're not having any strange drug-drug interactions and uh, we are able to uh, maintain these good drug concentrations that actually would translate theoretically in protecting women from getting HIV. This should protect women from getting HIV if, if, it, if it was worn for that purpose. All right, now, um, a lot of uh, talk recent uh, years has also been talked about protecting from rectal uh, HIV infection. And so we collected rectal fluids in the same study. And you would think an intravaginal ring shouldn't give you any kind of drug levels in the rectal space. But we were very surprised to see that that was not true. We actually could measure tenofovir in the rectal fluids. And when we added FTC, we could measure a lot of FTC, probably enough FTC there to provide some rectal protection as well. But when we added Maravroc, you can see that these are much lower concentrations. So Maravroc has a very strange and un unknown drug-drug interaction with um, tenofovir and FTC and depresses them. So adding Maravroc is not good in terms of rectal protection, something we did not expect at all to see. And that's the beauty of science. You know, when you do the experiment, uh, you get answers that nobody else has the answers to. And when you look at it statistically, uh, this is actually statistically significant. So uh, right now, uh, we just completed a follow-on study using just these two drugs because we didn't want this to be depressed uh, rectally. We wanted to try and have protection in both compartments. And we just finished a 28-day study in women in Texas with these two drugs. And we're looking forward to analyzing the data uh, later on early next year. And then we'll see what happens. So this is a very exciting project that uh, we took from concept all the way through early stage clinical trials. And we're very proud of that.
All right, so moving forward to a totally different project, uh, we're talking about something that you guys all know very a lot about, which is air quality. Uh, you've all seen the hazy days that we get here in Southern California. But in 1943, uh, the air quality here was actually not that bad, except that in July of 1943, the LA Times thought that we were actually uh, having a gas attack. Remember, this is uh, still uh, when World War II, and uh, they thought that there actually was an attack on Los Angeles. And here are some pictures from 1943, which I think are kind of cool, of downtown Los Angeles. That's what it looked like. So people were getting sick, their eyes were running, and they couldn't breathe. And they thought, what is going on here? Well, it turns out it was the first major episode of smog that since then has gotten a lot of attention. Long before you guys were born in the 1960s and 70s, smog was absolutely terrible here in Los Angeles. There were a lot of days where you couldn't go outdoors, the air was brown, and it was absolutely nauseous. Um, people always find a way to make money. And uh, back then, they actually put smog into a can and uh, sold it uh, around the world because we were so famous here for our terrible air quality. Luckily, things have gotten a lot better since then, but uh, they're still not that great, as I'm sure you've noticed yourselves. And the air quality still remains a problem, not just here in Los Angeles. That problem has now spread all over the world. And if you haven't watched the, the documentary Before the Flood, uh, I recommend that you do because it, it gives you a lot of insights into um, the air quality problem around the world. So basically, uh, this is how uh, LA looks on certain days. You've all seen this. We've got that white haze, uh, which is not uh, fog, unfortunately. Uh, but we have the same sort of problem in other cities around the world, uh, notably in China. Uh, some of the large cities there have terrible air quality problems. So what's causing the problem here? Um, we've done a lot. To, to improve things, as I said, since the early days of smog. And um, we've cleaned up a lot of the local industry and yet we still have these hazy days. Uh, the reason is mostly because of cars. On-road vehicles in Southern California are the reason that we still have uh, the air quality problems that we do. The problem is that right now, EPA only regulates three different uh, pollutants or pollutant classes that have to be measured. And then you've all known about the smog test. These are the things that people look for in a smog test and you have to be below certain values, but people don't really look at anything else. And we don't really fully understand what else could cars be emitting. And is there something else in car exhaust that's contributing towards this? Because these guys maybe don't tell us the whole picture and they don't really explain the haze completely. So we need to do some research, which is how we got involved back in the day we developed an instrument, which is called a remote sensing instrument, where we have spectrometers inside these boxes here that take light and split light into, uh, like a prism does, into its wavelength. And we're able to project these light beams across the street. You can see here the two little circles. These are two mirrors that send the light back to this main box, and it goes back and forth eight times across this freeway on-ramp. You can see here the the big mirror that's on the side of this instrument here. And as cars travel through uh, this beam of lights, we're able to see the absorption uh, of the light that is specific to the pollutants that we're trying to measure. And with that, we were able to measure a large array of pollutants. Um, and we looked at more than 2000 cars over a one week period. And for the first time, we were able to look and see what ammonia emissions from cars were. At that time, nobody knew anything about how cars emit ammonia. And we showed for the first time that actually ammonia is a very significant pollutant emitted by cars. And if you break down the cars and deciles, which means that basically every one of these uh, corresponds to 10% of the vehicle fleet, every one of these bars, and the 10% dirtiest vehicles make up over 60% of the total fleet. So if you fix those vehicles, the rest of the ammonia emissions of the whole fleet are actually very small in comparison. So we estimated back then, this was in, early to, in the early 2000s, that actually uh, 17 tons a day of ammonia was being emitted by cars here in the South Coast Air Basin, which was up to 10% of the total emissions of ammonia. And the white haze that I showed you before is ammonium nitrate predominantly, and the ammonia 
a lot of it comes from cars. So we were the first to show this, which is kind of cool. And it is actually also cool that the uh, CARB, the Air Resources Board of California, took note and is looking to regulate ammonia emissions from cars so that we get rid of that, that white haze. So a small study from a small research group in a small organization can make waves. So we took this to another level. We said, okay, that's cool that we can measure the ammonia emissions from cars as they travel up through this on-ramp, but I, we would like to see what happens when the car drives around. So we developed a complex group of instruments here in the back of a Prius that we could load up onto the back of a car. And it's our onboard measurement system. And you can see us here feverishly uh, putting the instrument together and um, getting everything situated so that we can drive it around on a course that we had set up in Pasadena, which involved freeway, on-road, idling, different driving modes. And uh, the, the back piece here interfaces directly into the tailpipe, which is not easy to do because you have a suburban or a, a small car like this uh, VW here, and they will emit at very different rates. In fact, the, the big suburban constantly melted our, our tubing, which was a real challenge. But it was really cool because one of the things that we did was actually uh, measure hydrogen cyanide. And some of you might think cyanide, that's a poison. Absolutely it is. And uh, we did a study to show that actually idling cars in a parking lot produce all of them, about 85% of the cars we tested produce hydrogen cyanide when they're idling. So you could potentially be exposing yourself to hydrogen cyanide as well as carbon monoxide. So um, we developed a laser system, which is this big boy here in this rack that measured hydrogen cyanide as we drove the car. And I'm gonna just quickly show you here a trace. And what that is here is a, it's a two-dimensional representation of time. So this axis here is time. And this is a, the, the wavelength of the laser essentially. And then the colors give you an idea of concentration. We can measure a lot of different compounds with this one laser trace, but the one that's interesting is hydrogen cyanide. And if you go down this line here, you can see the hydrogen cyanide over time. And the green is pretty much no hydrogen cyanide. So for the whole driving cycle, freeway, surface streets, stop and go, no real hydrogen cyanide emitted, that's good news. But here, we had a massive burst of large amounts of hydrogen cyanide emitted. That's what the red shows you. And that was, we could correlate that that corresponded to when the car left the parking lot and went onto the surface street. So basically what we think happened here is that you get hydrogen cyanide building up uh, on the catalyst of the car as you're idling. And when you drive off, that gets blown off and you get this massive gust of hydrogen cyanide emissions. And if you're standing behind that car, that's not necessarily a good thing. Here's a cool laser system that uh, my colleague, uh, John Moss developed. All right, so that's, that was a, a nice set of experiments. Now onto the, the last one, which is uh, studies on the freeway. And that's kind of my favorite because you can really get data on a lot of cars and, uh, and you're out in the wild uh, measuring things kind of uh, in the field. So basically our idea here is we're set up uh, by Herman Park, uh, by uh, Highland Park, uh, along the 110 freeway on the north side, there's a big park which gives us an ability to get a background side because you have to be able to look at the gradient. How do the pollutions change from the freeway to a neutral site? And you don't want cars being driving around there because that will really complicate your measurements. So what we're looking for is how the pollutions decrease from here to there. If there's a big steep slope of pollutant concentrations between these two sites, we know that the pollution comes from here, from the cars. Here is uh, the fence where we set up our instruments right by the freeway. Here's the car that uh, has a lot of other instruments in it, kind of our, like our, our central command post, which is here. And then the background site is right there, as far away as we can get from the freeway by these tennis courts. So we did a lot of measurements over many years at that site. And uh, what's really cool about this is we have the only data set in the world, or at least in Los Angeles, where we've tracked ammonia emissions, right? That's kind of like our thing. Um, how did they change over the years that we measure? We got like a nearly like an ice core type sample where we can go back in time and we know exactly how much ammonia was emitted over now uh, nearly 10 years. And uh, we started these studies in 2009 and the last one we did was in 2016 and we're hoping to get back out there in the years to come. 
So you remember I told you we have a freeway site and we have a background site. And the difference between those two is kind of this gradient from the freeway. And you can see here that over these years, these are the averages and the maxima and minima in these uh, box plots. But the blue squares and the whiskers are always much higher than the red ones, which shows that there is a significant emission from the freeway from the cars relative to our background site, which is fairly low. So the ammonia emissions have not really changed much when you convert all this with the number of vehicles and how much each individual vehicle is emitting. It's remained pretty steady, even though people are saying that the ammonia emissions um, are getting better. You know, people are now starting to finally look at this. So we're going to continue to watch this and see if, uh, if we are seeing a, a slow decline. And we collect the ammonia in case you're interested in these tubes here, which are coated with an acid. And uh, this is a student who is uh, collecting ammonia at the background site. That's actually me uh, right by the freeway uh, collecting uh, samples here. We're also measuring ozone with this instrument. We're filming the cars so we can get license plate information in case we have high emitters that we want to trace later on. So we're looking at a lot of different things, but I'm just talking about ammonia today. All right, my last slide of the day, and that one's one that I'm actually very excited about. Um, when you stand next to the freeway like I am right here, uh, it is very noisy and it's very turbulent. The air is just flowing in all directions. You can't hear yourself talk and you, you feel like you're in a kind of a, a, a windstorm. And you just go 100 yards that way away from the freeway and it's all quiet and there's hardly any air movement. And that's from these cars that are driving by. So we thought, what about all this road dust here? Uh, what's in that road dust? Uh, are there a lot of fungi, a lot of the viruses, are there a lot of bacteria? And do they get re-suspended um, in, re in the air? And, um, and is there a difference between how much bacteria and viruses are in the air here and fungi uh, compared to our background site? Because a lot of people who live very close to the freeway and maybe they're exposed to a lot more microorganisms than people that live just a hundred yards away from the freeway. Well, we were very surprised to see that when we asked that question, we actually do see a massive difference. In fact, these uh, bars show you uh, six successive days of sampling in one of our studies, 2016. And we collected the uh, suspended uh, particles and we were able to isolate the bacterial DNA from those samples and using a quantitative PCR reaction, we were able to quantify the number of bacterial copies per meter cubed of air. And at the, at the freeway site, we had uh, multiple orders of magnitude more bacteria in the air than we did at the background sites. And you can see this is consistent throughout. On this day here, we had way more uh, at the freeway site. So if you're standing by the freeway, if you live by the freeway, you're exposed to a lot more microorganisms suspended in the air than you would be if you were living a little further away. So it's not just pollution from the cars, it's the cars resuspending pollutants that are already there, including biological pollutants. So again, something that we never would have thought of had we not um, done these measurements and asked the question. So we're very grateful for all the wonderful financial support that we got over the years, uh, because without the money, you can't do the studies, you can't hire the people, you can't grow the organization, you can't pay the students. Uh, but really, um, aside from this financial support, we've really benefited from a phenomenal group of collaborators all across the United States, from the CDC to our collaborators in Texas and all over the country. We have a fantastic family here at Oakcrest. Our, our faculty, our staff uh, are really wonderful individuals um, and are all integral to the success of Oakcrest. It, it is not about me at all. It's about all of us as a team uh, doing this. I'm just here to one talking and, and conveying this today. Uh, we've had a lot of researchers over the year come through and we have over 400 alumni now uh, that we're very, very proud of uh, that have uh, gone on to do a lot of great things in a lot of different uh, technical careers um, and many of them in science and engineering. And hopefully some of you will um, be uh, motivated to, to do similar things down the road. So thank you all for your patience and for your attention. And I'm here now, I'm all yours to answer any questions you have. Hi, Mark. There are some questions in the chat box, which I will read out to you. 
California has been a leader in transitioning over to electric vehicles. Have you seen a difference or reduction in emissions? You still need power plants for the electricity needed for the EVs. Have you collected data on the emissions from power plants as well? That's a really great question. So uh, I'll start with the beginning. So electric vehicles, um, there's not enough of them yet on the road for us to see a significant decrease, but I think that that's slowly changing. Um, the fleets are growing and uh, uh, California has indeed led the way. So I'm hoping that we will start seeing reductions um, as electric vehicles are phased in. It's also a, a very complicated thing to kind of uh, deconvolute because uh, emissions are getting less and less because vehicles are getting cleaner because the catalyst technology, the fuel technology, the emission control technology, they're all getting better. And so you kind of have to separate that from the contribution from electric vehicles, which is why the onboard measurements probably would be helpful in, in figuring this out. Power plants. So California gets a lot of its power. So for example, Pasadena produces some of its power internally, but a lot of it comes from out of state. So it's really hard to kind of factor that in. We have not looked at stationary sources like power plants uh, directly, uh, but I can give you an example that's very much uh, personal, which is I have an electric vehicle and here at Oak Crest, we have solar panels and a solar carport and a charger. So I charge my electric vehicle using energy that's produced from the sun. So it doesn't necessarily have to collect, come from a power plant to produce these, the energy to charge your solar car. And we're transitioning more and more to solar here in California. And solar power is now cheaper than coal. In fact, it's probably the cheapest source of power right now. Uh, so I think it's only a matter of time before we move ex exclusively to solar to power uh, batteries in cars. So hopefully that answers your question. Good one. From all the environmental and health problems we deal with, how are you able to get inspiration for concentrating your research projects on these exact problems? I think there's a combination of things. First of all, there's the things that are close to your heart that, that you feel passionate about and want to pursue as a scientist. There is also the pragmatic approach, quite honestly, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, that you, know, you have to pay for this. So you have to be able to get grant funding. Uh, the NIH, for example, has been very generous to us. They funded a lot of our work, but they have very specific programs that they want to fund. They want to fund very specific things. So if you're interested in something, but they are not interested in funding it, then it's really hard to do it. Um, we are lucky that we have discretionary funds, internal funds, that we can use to start pilot programs to just see if there is a, something there and that, that it's worth pursuing. And then we have to still go back and get the funding to then do this on a larger scale. So it's a combination of your personal motivations, uh, where you can get funding and, uh, and where you think you can make a contribution, right? So for example, I, I'm absolutely passionate about climate change. And I think that is our biggest challenge uh, coming up. But I don't have any particular skill in modeling. Um, so there's not that much that I can do that others aren't already doing with regards to climate change, other than talking to folks like you guys and get you interested in being advocates of climate change. So you, these are kind of the limitations that, that surround uh, that question, which is, which is very, very, a very difficult one to answer. Is it hard doing your job? Do you think hard work is worth it? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna digress a little bit. Um, people ask me, knowing what you know now, and this is kind of related to your question, would you, would you do it all over again? Did I ever think it would be so hard to get to where we are today? So now we're about 20, 25 people full-time here at Oakcrest. In non-COVID years, we would have probably 20 or 30 students doing research in the lab at some point. And then we'd have large groups of uh, high school kids and others uh, come and spending the day, multiple days here. So we've reached this kind of size and we started off just, just me and that one student that I showed you the picture of. That has taken a long time to get here and it's been really hard to get here. It has been much harder than I ever imagined. Like I told you, you know, I imagine this very naively getting into it, thinking hey, this is going to be a piece of cake, and it absolutely was not a piece of cake. It's taken blood, sweat, and tears to get to where we are today. So I, I think that I would do it all over again because the reward is just so great. Um, I love what I do. I'm excited, not every single day, but most days to come to work. Uh, I love interacting with students. I love doing what I'm doing right now, talking to you guys. 
uh, the fact that we've had over 400 people come through here and affected a number of lives uh, is phenomenal. The fact that we've been able to develop products that might benefit humanity is amazing. And the fact that I can do that and get paid to do that is just unbelievable. So it is a commitment though, right? I mean, I do work six, seven days a week and I work you know, reasonably long hours. So there, that's the price you pay, but it, it's worth it entirely for me, yes. What are the costs of the drug tablets that you put into the pods in the intravaginal rings? Do you give the rings out free to the young women in Southern Africa? If not, what is the price of the rings? These are, these are really good questions. My God, you guys, you guys uh, are meant for this stuff. Um, right, so the cost of the pods, uh, the, the, the drug, so the, the, the hypothesis here is that once you get something that works, because this is a purely humanitarian project, right? So we're not, we're not ever gonna be making any money on this, nor is anybody else. So um, the, the, the drug itself supposedly would be given by the pharmaceutical company uh, as a donation, essentially. And uh, the manufacturing of the rings varies tremendously uh, depending on the materials you use, it, it silicone versus other uh, elastomers, and the quantity of rings that you make. But uh, the, the cost of the ring would be uh, low dollars, maybe tens of dollars per ring. And you kind of divide that by the number of days you can use it. So the cost per day. And uh, there's a lot of talk about using a ring for 90 days instead of just using it for one month. So that gives you kind of an idea of the cost. We would not be making those rings because we're a nonprofit organization. So our role would be just to do the, the research and then somebody else would take it forward. But um, the rings were always supposed to be provided free of charge uh, to the people who need them in Sub-Saharan Africa so that it makes a big difference. So we were hoping that you know, the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, uh, et cetera, would step in and, um, and help support this effort because it is uh, beneficial to, to humankind with the, num the numbers that I showed you earlier. Do you ever second guess yourself? And what is the most wonderful experience from your job? <laughs> I second guess myself every day. Otherwise, I wouldn't be honest with myself. Um, there's always things you can do better. Uh, you always make mistakes. And if you're humble, you can learn from them. I'm trying to do that. Uh, and um, what was the second part of the question? Do I, do I what? What is the most wonderful experience from your job? I don't think there is a single most wonderful experience. I think just seeing... The, the look in, in the students' eyes when they're here for the first time and they start to see what research is really doing for them and the excitement and motivation that it breeds and uh, the collegiate spirit that we have here amongst our team, that, that environment and culture is probably the biggest joy that I get out of what I do. Awesome, thank you so much. Um for sharing all of this, given the time, uh, we are gonna go ahead and, and start to wrap this up. Thank you, Dr. Baum, for joining us today. We appreciate you sharing your story as a young chemist and the lessons you have learned throughout the years, sharing your personal and business milestones and discussing all the great research and life-changing projects that uh, OCRES is working on. Um, once again, thank you for, for coming here and presenting to our wonderful students. Uh, teachers, please make sure you sign in and you sign out as well. Important to sign out. Students, same as you, make sure you sign in. Um, and with that said, thank you for joining us. We will have Ocrest come on board and do more amazing presentations next semester. So this is not it. This is not the end. There's more to come. Um, and you are free to go. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Stay safe.